Greetings, everyone. Richard Solomon taking care of business and my father's place radio. We are blessed, and I truly mean blessed, to have Jeremy Clyde on the phone with us. Uh, if you don't know Jeremy Clyde, he has, he has a resume that if I actually started just listing all of the things that he's done from you know, the 1960s, being part of Chad and Jeremy, and acting and, and movies and, and all kinds of <laughs> music and the like... The show would be over, and we would have a chance to talk to our guests. So, without mm. further ado, uh, thank you so much for being with us. And it's a pleasure. All right. so, thank you. So, thank you're going to be performing at my father's place. I'm going to be performing at my father's place. I'm uh, on the uh, Thursday, this August the second. It says, yes. and what I'm doing there is kind of well. Um, I've got a lot of. It's called the bottom drawer sessions. That's the that's the the generic title. In other words, I've got all this material that I've been writing, uh, actually, in conjunction with a guy. There was a, some, I mean, I'll tell you when it was. It was December 1979. I, the jazz, noted jazz singer, Annie Ross, I, run into, I ran into her in London. And she says, oh, I'm giving a party. Why don't you come? Oh, fine, yeah. So uh, we got told up, and off we went. And there I met a guy uh, who is uh, very tall. I thought he was actually American, he would turn out to be Canadian, and he had a, um, a big a, a cowboy hat on, which is unusual in London. I said, what do you do? He says, I'm a lyricist. I said, I've always wanted to meet a lyricist. And his name was David Pierce, Big Dave, as he was known, because of his tall nature. Um, and I went round to his place, looked in his bottom drawer, and there were an astonishing amount of poems and short stories and lyrics and anything you could see. Uh, and he'd actually been working with other people. I turn, turns out I knew his band called Meal Ticket. Anyway, he and I did 35 years hard work, and he left us some years ago, about five years ago, and I realized that all this material, some of which Chad and I had touched, but it was so vast. I mean, it's a huge catalog. And I decided to put it out because it won't exist unless I do it, something about it. And so about four years ago, in fact, four years ago, I put out the bottom drawer sessions number one. And recently, bottom drawer sessions number four, they've gone that way. And there will be, I think, seven, possibly eight. And with that, armed with that, and a lot of, oh, I mean, stuff that I did, in the, that Chad and I did in the late 60s, which I wrote all the songs for, uh, from uh, Ab the later albums uh, of Cabbages and Kings and The Ark. Um, and you put all that together, plus the hits, and suddenly it's actually quite an extraordinary sort of show. And... I'm trying it out. Uh, Kate Taylor, um, sister of well, the famous Taylor family, so sister of James, uh, is is coming to help out. She's going to open, and I'll hope to get her back on stage at the end and all that. We have yet to do this. This is a great <laughs> experiment. Uh, and anybody that wants to come along and see something that is going to be, um, I don't know, I hope, I tried it out once, and it really, really worked. Um, and I'm, you know, and that's what I'm up to. Plus, I'm working with Peter Asher, uh, because now Gordon having died some years ago, and Chad having retired, uh, Peter and I are going out and having more fun than you can believe. Um, and as Peter likes to say, we've got twice the hits and twice the stories, and it's true. So that's the sort of, that's the commercial end. And then there's the, um, you know, when I'm trying different stuff. And uh, anyway, that's what I'm up to. All right, so let me, um, ask, let me, let me ask a couple of questions, because yeah. in some ways, it's almost like a time machine. So you're taking, you know, the, the current age and your current wisdom and experience, and you're revisiting things that you wrote when your emotions and your inspirations yeah. and your perspectives yeah. were probably yeah. different because, yeah. you know, yeah. technology was different. The world was different. Everything was yeah. different. How do yeah. you look at it now? Well, that's the point. It, absolutely right. Um, the, the, the two last albums I mentioned, well, I'll tell you a quick story. I went into a record shop in England um, within the past six months. And I was chatting to the guy, oh, yeah, CDs, yeah, can't move them, blah, blah, blah. Except, he says, 
yes, I say, for 60s psychedelic. I said, really? Really? And it turns out that um, the two albums we made at, at the end of our, at the end of the 60s, so 67, 68, um, the Cabbages and Kings and, and the Ark, both for Columbia, have now become this sort of cult albums. And people have an interest. And while I, in, you know, people have all these programs about 50 years ago, 1968, and you find, and I have, dug out some of these songs and they're really interesting to hear stripped down about basically how I and therefore we because I was just reflecting the culture felt about things that were going on then and you can look at those songs and you say well did the dream work did it uh, did some of it work um, it's interesting it has a real perspective uh, which I did not expect. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that, that um, you know, the guys of my generation come out and say, now I'd like to do a new song, and uh, the whole place empties. Because <laughs> 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 bored. But the, in the bottom drawer, which is, goes from 1970 to 2015, uh, um, is, you know, this, uh, these aren't new songs. Some of these are from the 70s, some of these are from the 80s, 90s, you know. They're a, a, a great mixture of, of influences and times, and uh, it's, you know, interesting to look back. So, yeah. so as a music archaeologist of your own archaeology, <laughs> what is the trend that you've seen as your as how, how, what have you noticed about your own evolution of your own music and style over that time period now that you have the the beauty of a rear view mirror well yes it's 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 one of the things is we started out as folk singers because that's what two guitar I go Chad and I both play guitar Chad also a wonderful piano player was and um so we started out doing sort of copying what we heard from America. So there was, I mean, I was a guy called um, uh, Josh White, who I was very, very taken with, who is a bit sort of cult person now. Uh, but I mean, it could be anyway. It could be the Peter Paul and Mary or the Kingston singers or anything. Kingston Brothers. But actually, acoustic music is now being called folk again. It's something has happened in the intervening um, where uh, so that anybody who plays a sort of an acoustic guitar and it can have a nice rock beat now. That is quite acceptable. Folk music doesn't have to be about sailors in the 1800s. <laughs> uh, you know, it's become some. So we the definition of folk music has changed and has come back full circle to encompass the kind of thing that I like to do and write. In, in, the, in the 1960s, how did American folk music differ from British folk music? Well, um, it was slavery was a big, obviously a huge uh, part of it. Um, and railways and uh, the West, the opening up, and of course, the romance of American names. I mean, you know, Tallahassee and Route 66 mm -hmm. and I don't know. I mean, they, they have a, um, uh, it, it's not the same if, if you talk about crew or, <laughs> or um, you know, Doncaster. Um, English names don't have that. Okay. There's a sort of, there's a sort of uh, wonderful romance of the American West, which still comes through folk songs. Particularly. Good branding. <laughs> and whereas, whereas English folk songs tend to be about fishing and people dying at sea and being unhappy about it, you know, usually sung by the wife who's been left behind. Or mining disasters. They're always, they're, they, they, they cut across. You have mining disasters too. But it, the, historically, uh, it's the American West that so is a huge influence. What, what drew you to folk music? as opposed to any other contemporary music that you were growing up with or heard? Well, I mean, I was brought up, I suppose, on the American musical, so the Great American Songbook now, as, as it's now known. Um, you know, the Rogers and Hart and all the rest of them. Um, 
that was mine. I came to, I, well, I started to learn the piano, and in the age that um, I was brought up in, uh, teaching methods were pretty rough. So if you played a bum note, which I did a lot of, the guy who was teaching, the teacher, would stand behind you and hit you Ooh. across the back of the head. <laughs> and I, <laughs> unsurprisingly, <laughs> this wasn't so much fun. And so I stopped piano lessons and took up the ukulele and from the ukulele i took up the guitar and once you take up the guitar you're in guitar world and now you're in the world of you know and then elvis arrives who brings together soul music uh country music i mean the whole stew and so it's elvis who is the great opener of the door um, to particularly to Amer- uh, particularly to English people because they'd never heard anything like it. I, I, can, can I uh, sure. d- 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 I drop a name very yes. quickly? Which is George Harrison once told me how he was uh, on a bicycle on the outskirts of Liverpool somewhere. He must have been very young, and he heard this music. And it was obviously good weather. The music, but the window was open. There was he was under a, passing a house where the window was open. And there was a song being played, presumably on a gramophone, as we then would have said. And it was such an amazing sound, he had to get off his bicycle and stand under the window and wait until it was over. And what he was listening to was Heartbreak Hotel, which was the first uh, Elvis record that we had in England, because everything was slightly different. Um, And that, it just, I mean, a whole generation... um, I had Peter Asher, who I'm working with now, an uh, old friend of mine, Peter and Gordon. We've known each other for a long, long time. Um, and, you know, we agree. That was the moment when we all got off our bicycles and went, okay, this is for us. Is, is that when, like, the lightning struck? You know, like, you know, yeah. when, you know yeah. when Ben Franklin yeah. was flying the kite and the, the lightning storm? Yeah. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. That's it. Bing. <laughs> now, yeah. when, you, when you took the piano lessons, was that your idea or was your parents' idea? It was my parents' idea. And uh, they knew I could. They knew I was musical. I, I could sing in tune from a very early age, and sh- showed a considerable interest. And so the piano lessons were. Well, thank you. I mean, for paying for them. But um, it it was the teaching methods. Uh, and once I sort of got my hands on the guitar, everything everything goes from there because it's really it's the generational instrument, I guess. Well, um, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. You mentioned George Harrison. George Harrison was famous for ukuleles. He'd have people over his house uh-huh. and hand them ukuleles. Uh-huh. I've I've been there. So what was that like? You know, when they break Fun. out the ukuleles. <laughs> Fun. And, Except and, my 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 ukulele chords. I've got five chords now that I can remember because you know I was eleven or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I was still playing, and I haven't sort of kept it up. Uh, but for those of us, a lot of other people kept it up. So I was sort of, you know, scraping along behind. <laughs> so had that, what did you guys play together? What? When you George. and George were playing the... You, oh, well, yeah. I mean, this was, I don't know, I can't remember. You, you playing like folk songs? You playing, you know... Yeah, yeah. No, 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 George, uh, no, no, mainly he was, he was a huge fan of George Formby. Okay. Uh, and this may not be known much to... Uh, American audiences. I'm leaning on the lamppost at the corner of the street until my little old lady goes by. Oh me, oh my. Uh, yeah, he was a huge star in pre-war England. And he played a banjo lately, if you want to get technical. Wow. And he was very good at it, too. And, and uh, he was the man. So it was a lot of, from George's point of view, it was a lot of northern, because uh, George was very northern. He was Lancashire, um, and he sang in that dialect, and that was that was George's great influence, wow. which I didn't share. I mean, I sit back and admire. What other influences did you have? So you have the Elvis moment. What what other? We have like two minutes in this segment. But what what other things started shaping you on your journey? So you got the piano lessons. You got these other things. You got your guitar. Elvis, what's now converging on you? What's uh, rock and roll? Ah. Rock and roll. It's 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 Eddie Cochran. It's Buddy Holly. It's um, uh, yeah. It's 
Jean Vincent. It's 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 everything that. 1956, the gears change. Everything changes. And a whole generation goes, hang on a minute, this is for us. <laughs> uh, and I was incredibly swept up in that. Uh, plus, of course, there was actually, there is still, um, uh, was then, I guess, uh, Cliff Richard and the Shadows. Now, this is not a band that's known very much over here. But uh, Hank Marvin, lead guitarist, and uh, Bruce Welsh, rhythm guitarist, Chad and I, he, Ch Chad would pretend to be Hank and I would be Bruce. And we do, we had a little band when we were at uh, drama school and uh, called The Jerks. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Interesting name. we were truly pretty jerkish. Uh, not too good, but actually, basically, we were doing uh, Shadows covers. This is all very English stuff, uh, and it never really get made it across the pond. Although, if you scratch any musician from my generation, they'll all tell you about Hank Marvin and the influence he, he was to us all. So, what I, I, I probably won't be able to get the full answer on this because we only have a little bit of time in this segment, but I can what, try what, and keep it what, what radio stations were you listening to to capture all this great music? Uh, yeah. Or well, was it live? Or was it like, were you trying to catch no, it live no, no, or no, radio? No, no. Or? It was very difficult. To, no, it was very, very difficult to listen to. They were playing light music, which was, I don't know, Patty Page and that kind of stuff. Um, and But there was a pirate radio. The, the famous movie that they made about it, yeah. Yeah. Did, did you no, listen well, to no, that? That came later. No, no. The, first of all, there was Radio Luxembourg, which was... Are if being broadcast with a lot of sort of uh, intermittent signal, frankly, uh, on medium wave or something, or long wave. Um, and then later, you've got the pirates who just sat in ships being uh, seasick or just offshore, about 12 miles offshore, uh, and therefore could get round the, the, the business of... Because it was also the Mus Musicians' Union had great arguments about the music should be live so playing records was taking away musicians um living and so a lot of when I, chad and i later started to get hits in england we would do live radio shows live with orchestras wow yeah all right let me cut you off right here for one second this is richard song with jeremy clyde please don't leave us we'll be right back all right, welcome back. Richard Solomon, uh -huh. Jeremy Clyde. This is an incredible show. For those who are just joining us, hop right in. We're, we're, we're talking about all kinds of great moments in music history that uh, Jeremy Clyde was part of. Now, I, I didn't even get a chance to ask you about your television <laughs> appearances in the 1960s. Uh, you were on Batman, Patty Duke, all this really wild stuff. How did, how did that... I don't mean to transgress, but... How did you get involved in that? And I have some interesting stories about that. Okay, well, um, and first of all, the first, the first uh, was the Dick Van Dyke show. Uh, the story was basically that we, um, because uh, as you uh, may know, I, I'm also I have another career as an actor in England. But Chad and I met at drama school. That's where we met. So the Central School of Speech and Drama. He wasn't actually on the. Um, on the drama course. He was on the teacher training course. But um, people knew I strummed a few chords, and somebody came up at the beginning of the second year, which was I'd been there a year, and said, hey, there's a new guy. He's arrived. He's, he's really good. He can play. And there was this big hit by The Shadows, which I was just talking about. Um, and he said, he can play Apache the whole way through. I said, take me to this musical genius. My God. And that's how Chad and I met. So, um, what was the question? Sorry. No, so, uh, how did you get involved in all these TV shows like Batman, Patty Duke? So, so, they knew. So, the word what went around that we could handle a little, a little bit of dialogue. I wouldn't call it great acting, but we could say a line and stand up straight and make it sort of a bit of comedy timing, maybe. And that's how we got, uh, certainly started with the Dick Van Dyke show. And there's, uh, if, there's an extraordinary thing. There's a moment they, they, they were so nice to us. I mean, we were so green. We were just straight out of drama school. You know, what were we doing there? We were there with a comedy gods. And they would encourage you, have sort of like five days rehearsal, and then you shoot it, and then people took the weekend off, and they'd do another one. And 
you, they'd say, oh, do try anything, you know, throw anything in. So I put in this ridiculous joke. And the joke was, I, I point to a, a, a piece of furniture in, 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 uh, in the, the house. In Rob and Laura's uh, house. <laughs> in Rob and Laura, thank you, Rob and Laura's house. And I say, do you know what we call one of these in England? And Dick says, no. And I say, a chair. Now, <laughs> Dick thought this was very funny. He thought this, oh, we've got to keep it in. We're going to keep it in. We're going to keep it in. And if you look at the tape, actually, it gets a huge laugh. And I think it's, I mean, it's a really lame joke. But all I can tell you is Chad and I, uh, some years ago now, were checking into an airport. And the guy looks at us. And he looks at the guitars, and he looks up, and he says, a chair. <laughs> <laughs> so there you are. So, hey, man, it wasn't that bad. So then we did that. We did the Patty Duke show. We did two episodes of Batman. And the Catwoman stole our voices and put them in a box and held the British government to ransom. And the British, <laughs> the British government refused to pay up. There's a wonderful line. Uh, which the British ambassador was given to say, which is, Chad and Jeremy, not a penny for those blighters. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff, great stuff. What? So, yeah, that's, that's how it worked. And it was such fun. Now, interestingly, at the time, we were seen as being a bit lightweight. We weren't being serious musicians. We weren't being, I don't know, um, yeah, we weren't out there. Uh, we were sort of being making fools of ourselves on television. And actually, it's completely like so many things, it's interesting to look back, it's completely switched because those shows, because they've been run and run and run and run, have now gone into the consciousness and have now completely <laughs> sort of kept us alive in a funny kind of way in the American consciousness, or certainly helped it. Oh, interesting these, how it works. And these, these, these are iconic shows, you know, Patty yeah, Duke. No. And, you know, when, when I was little, I was on an airplane to Florida, and I'm, on, I'm sitting in the, air, the airplane with my parents. It was probably an Eastern Airlines plane, uh, and I get a little tap on my shoulder from the seat behind me. And a, a gentleman says, do you like Batman? And I'm like, of course. <laughs> It, it turned out he was the producer for the Batman television series. Oh, and oh. he gave me, like, these autographed, you know, uh, cards of, like, Batman and Robin. I was like, oh, wow, this is, a, this is really cool, <laughs> you know? And uh, it's just, you know, it's funny, you know, and, and look, Dick Van Dyke is still around. He does, like, those Tai Chi commercials and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they repeat all, you know, it, there's some... There's like a network that has, you know, all the old shows. There's actually several sure. of them. There's BTV, sure. there's Cozy, sure. there's a bunch of them, yeah. Antenna TV. Yeah. And, you know, when you look back at, you know, some of those episodes were, were filmed in black and white. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you look at the people, they were just, you know, the sets were simpler, The you know. Uh, what was what was it like to, what was um, Mary Tyler Moore like? Because she was very she young. Was great. They were both, they, they were both so kind, so... Um, welcoming um so completely as you would want them to be now this isn't always the case to show business, <laughs> but you know uh in this case i could certainly say that um that, that they they were just lovely and that's why i mean i felt you know relaxed enough to try out things because they were trying out things does that work i don't know do you think yeah. that might you know uh, it was an actor thing, and I immediately responded to that. I said, well, how about if I do this? And they would go, yeah, or no, or maybe. And it was that relaxed. And there's Carl Reiner. I mean, these people are gods. Um, and so they were. So they were, they, they were sweet, absolutely sweet. Well, did, did you feel like you knew them because you watched some of their shows, and then when you got no, to meet them? No, because we hadn't much watched. I mean, I came to, we came to America in early '64. January 64, uh, for the first time. And um, that's when I first saw that sort of American television. So I'd seen a little bit, but I'm not, I, you know, I came from a different culture where there were different heroes on, on television. And in fact, there was hardly any television. Television only really arrived in England in 1953 because of the coronation, uh, when everybody wanted to watch this big event and television sets became suddenly uh, everybody went out and got one. But until that, I mean, I was brought up 
only on radio. But, but in many ways, did that expand your imagination? Oh, wonderful. As they all, I mean, the old thing is, you know, the pictures are better on radio. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I may have to say that. So I, I did... Listen. Yeah, take it. It's yours. So, so I did. I did. I did do a little, you know, pre-production research, and I, I did read that, you know, of course, you know, you know, I have to ask the sources that you have some relationship to the royal family. No, no, uh, no, noble. If you wish to get that, uh, yeah. Um, I, my grandfather at the time of the coronation was the seventh Duke of Wellington. And as the Duke of Wellington, he need, if you're going to be part of the ceremony, which he was very much, very, very much part of the ceremony, uh, you have to have a page, and a page carries your coronet so that you can put it on your head once the monarch has been crowned. Everybody puts their hats on. Trust me, it's England. It's, we do different <laughs> things. We do things differently over there. Um, and so that's what I was, that's my... Uh, I was part of the coronation. And one of the weird things, and, and Peter and I, and our Peter Asher and I, in our show, talk about this, is that we discovered that at the same time as I'm feet from the Queen watching it all happen, uh, really an extraordinarily upfront, privileged position. But above me, in the choir, without a view at all, was the young Keith Richards. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that amazing? Uh, and we, we've actually come up with a picture of him at the choir, uh, with his choir. Anyway, there you are. Thank, so, so of all these f- people that you've rubbed elbows with, who, have you, who else have you collaborated with or had jam sessions with or um, got to be mu- um, mu- musical with? Well, actually, I haven't much. There's a reason for that. Um, and that is that Chad and I arrive in 64. We break up in early 69. I then go back to England and start another complete, another career, which involves going to the West End and then at Broadway and do plays and all kinds of other things and tellies. And then Chad and I have a, we try to get together uh, in the 80s and that doesn't really work. Because if, if you're going to be an acoustic duo and you're going to get together uh, in the mid-'80s, the time when Madonna's just starting out, and actually everybody's on synthesizers with huge hair and big shoulders, I mean, it isn't the time for an acoustic duo. It just it could hardly have been the worst time. <laughs> but we had a good... I mean, we, we did well. We, 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 we had a great young band, and it, but it just fell apart. Timing. And then, uh, in sort of the early 2000s, uh, PBS got onto us and said, do you want the guys who want to try something, just come out and do 20 minutes, and it's a concert with a lot of oldies. And I wasn't as busy as I should have been, and Chad was up for it, and we got together, and we rehearsed up 20 minutes, and we walked on, just the two of us, with two acoustic guitars, or acoustic guitar and piano and did our 20 minutes, and people went mad. And we looked at each other and said, well, we've got to do some more of this. And that's when we've done sort of 15 years before Chad retired, uh, basically. And now I'm with Peter. So the answer is I haven't been hanging around musicians, other musicians, because I've been in another, completely another world. Um, I mean, I was a member of Sir Lawrence Olivier's old Vic company at the, you know, at the, in London which is, you know, I mean, serious classical theater. It's a different, it's a different world. Um, so I've only really worked with Chad, <laughs> to be truthful. Um, now I'm having enormous fun because I'm beginning to work with all kinds of, uh, I mean, I'm working on the, the date that we, you know, at my father's place on the August the 2nd. Um, I'm, there's a marvelous cello player called Emily uh, Elkin who's going to come on and do some things with me as well. And Kate Taylor is starting off the thing, and then we'll probably try and get her back on towards the end, and I'm working with all kinds of new musicians. I'm actually starting to work with new musicians for the first time now, and it's very, very exciting. So what, what, what is new and, and what is the same about being with new musicians when you're doing you know, duets and things like that? 
musicians are musicians are musicians are musicians. <laughs> if you're look, I mean, I'm tending to work with people who play acoustic instruments because that's my kind of bag. And you know, if you're an, a guitarist, you have either you you know you've got certain skills. Uh, there's a possible violinist I want to work with. I'd love to work with a uh, you know a trio or something at some point. Um, I've just been trying sort of some rather funk the tracks I'm looking at for the future. Uh, I'm I, I'm exploring because now Chad has retired in a funny kind of way. If you are part of a double act and the guy is still around and he's a really wonderful musician and he's an old friend of yours, why why look elsewhere? Well, but it's interesting because it's it's sort of pushed me into this late surge. <laughs> When you when you do things now, do you ever call up Chad and just say, "I, I need I need to run this by you"? <laughs> just to no, see. I'd love to. I, I'd love to. Uh, he no, he's he's um, the old boy is slowing down a bit and has gone into a bit of a different space and okay. and sort of doesn't want to know because what we did is what we did and I sort of think he would like to be out on the road. Maybe, but it doesn't feel he's up to it anymore. And so there's a sort of, I think he's closed that door rather, yeah. um, which is a shame. But there you are. I mean, that's what happens. Uh, people grow old at different uh, speeds, I guess. So speaking of the road, what are the venues that you really love playing in? That that you know really that, you know because there's all kinds of venues, with all kinds of sound systems and uh, energy or audience energy. Some are more intimate. Ooh, uh, so what, what are well, the ones that the, you're like, wow? Remember that show? Wolf, well, okay, the Wolf Trap Barns in, uh, in Virginia um, have the most. It's just it's a barn and it's built. It's wood, and they have the most wonderful sound system. And Chad and I sold it out regularly. Uh, I've yet to go back. I'd love to. That was a particular favorite. Um, there was a, a show. We did a sort of a bit of a, a kind of special for, uh, I suppose, for Cousin Brucey. Okay. Um, a former guest uh, of this show. Yes, yes. Oh, right. There yes. you are. Uh, with that, with, and Peter and I went on, and we did not our normal show, which is much more discursive, and that we show clips from Batman and all the rest of it and tell stories and jokes and all that kind of stuff. But this was just knock out the hits time. And there were I don't know, over 7,000 people there, wow. and, which is a nice crowd. Uh, and we got to the end of Summer Song, and they just wouldn't stop applauding. It just went on and on and on. Um, Must have been and touching. that was extraordinary. And that yeah. was a few months ago. Wow. I mean, uh, you know, yeah, earlier this year. Um, and that was extraordinary to go. I haven't played in front of that kind of a crowd uh, for a long time. And what is extraordinary about Summer Song is it's beca it has this sort of iconic quality now, which seems to be getting more. I mean, Chad and I always knew that because I think it was our song and we'd do it and people would applaud. Uh, but it seemed to be getting more and more. And I think it's because... Time has passed. It's becoming more iconic. It's people's memories are... And also, it's been in movies. It's been in Rushmore and Princess Diaries and Men in Black 3. <laughs> okay. um, uh, yeah, you know, so there you are. Well, you know, it's funny. When, when people like myself are you know, in the radio studio and we're talking to other radio people and we talk about the soundtrack that we grew up, that song... Yeah. That was part of all of us listened to, so you know, da, 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 you know and mm -hmm. you know, it's 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 almost a part of our music DNA, as you know, yeah. you know. So yeah. you know, uh, I mean, there's a lot of songs that are out there, but I think the songs that we grew up on, because you know, I, I, you know, I grew up in the '60s, and so to me, that was like, wow, you know, this is that was, you know, that, those were the first real songs that you heard repeatedly um and that was just part of everything and then 
now yeah. it brings back that memory like oh remember yeah. remember when we used to listen to that or those songs yeah. it was it was spectacular so so for all the people like myself who were back in those days listening to you i want to thank you now because I couldn't oh. thank you personally then. <laughs> oh, thank you, Rich. <laughs> My dear but, fellow. but I want to say th- thank you for making some of the most important music that I grew up on. Oh, and uh, it's always good to be able to tell the people at some point, you know, hey, that was a song. It's a very, <laughs> it's a very weird thing, you know, because if, while you're doing it, you don't know the effect you're having. If, if, you're, if you're the person sort of doing it, you're, you, anyway, in that case, you, uh, back then... In 64, 65, 66, one was on a roller coaster. You just, you just did what people told you, went onto the stage, you did the interview, you did the television, you didn't sleep. Um, you just did. did. Um, and it's only later that people come up and tell you. I mean, I'll tell you, as a guy came up to us once, who was one of the most extraordinary things that ever been said to me, actually, came up after a show says Chad and I, a show, and said, I just want to tell you guys that you got me through Vietnam. Wow. That's wow. a hell of a thing for somebody to say. Wow. And it, what he meant was there was a compilation tape of which Summer Song was on it, and that compilation tape got him through Vietnam. Wow. And, that's, you, know, and you think, wow, how did that happen? You know, you were just sort of, you know, got lucky. Anyway, maybe amazing. we'll be right back. Richard Solomon, Jeremy Clyde. Don't miss the rest. This is going to be awesome. All right. Richard Solomon taking care of business. My father's place radio. Jeremy Clyde. Uh, such a great show. So uh, vinyl's back, right? Yes. I mean, this is, I mean, of all things. And what is interesting, because the I, we are going to put out uh, the bottom drawer sessions. Okay. I've been putting this stuff out for now for the past four years, uh, five, nearly five. And it's become, it's got a small but fanatical following. Um, these songs and people have got, oh my God, I didn't know you realized you had all this. Yes, well, I've been writing for all these years. And um, what is interesting about them is that they, they've dated, because the, the archive goes from 1970 to 2015. But actually, the guy who wrote the lyrics, Big Dave Pierce. Uh, the guy with the cowboy hat. Do, <laughs> Yeah, the cowboy hat guy, the cowboy hat guy, uh, who uh, died about um, five years ago, I suppose, now. And great, great friend. And he and I, we'd meet from time to time in, in various, he lived in Paris a lot. Uh, uh, we worked in England, Los Angeles, and Paris over the years, over 35 years. Uh, when I was free, basically, we'd sort of nip over, and we'd work very hard for 10 days, and then I'd go away and do other things. Um, and the songs have not dated, the music has dated much less than the lyrics. Because the lyrics, what has happened is that people remember each, telef- remember each other's telephone numbers, or can't get hold of each other, or write letters, or receive letters, sometimes scented. Um, this world has now gone. And it's, it's fascinating, cause it's, and it's fine. It's, I don't care. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, this is all part of a, a past era. And what is extraordinary is the world has now come round again. This, this keeps happening every time. If you live long enough, this is what happens. And it, suddenly vinyl is back. And these, we're going to put out a, a special best of sort of called Top Draw. Ah, and the box go. set, but the box set will be the chest of drawers, of course. Uh, so the bottom drawer sessions will carry on uh, for as many albums as I can come up with, which I think is about seven, possibly eight. Um, and then we will start digging into that. And they've and we've now got uh, the top drawer, the, the vinyl album, and they really belong on vinyl. And it's extraordinary. I mean, I, because the, they were written for a vinyl age. You know, it's so true. Uh, and, 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 and I'm very happy with this. And, and in a funny kind of way, you, you, could, you stop being dated and you start being classic. <laughs> <laughs> so, he, said, he said, hopefully. So do you have a vinyl record collection? I do. Uh, but which I haven't played much, to be honest, recently. Uh, I do have it. Um, I know my son plays a lot of vinyl. Um, 
and I know people who will only listen now on vinyl, um, and a lot of musicians will only collect on vinyl. I, I've been rather f- over to, overly fond of CDs, which I now have so many thousands that I've, I'm in a, uh, it's a bit of a crisis, really. Uh, so I've got to have a, a dig through. Um, I'll tell you what the real, but, cri- yeah. I'll tell you what the real crisis is because I have a lot of CDs myself. I've noticed that the new automobile manufacturers are not putting CD players in the newer cars. That's the crisis. I, not not yeah, having the CDs yeah. is not being able to play them. I just bought. I, I completely agree with you. I just bought a car, uh, which is basically a sort of nearly new job, and I had to look around to find a car that still <laughs> has a CD player in it because that's what I wanted. But I found one. Yeah, yeah it's then, a real problem. All right, do you still have the disc washer? And you know, you know how when we all used our vinyl records, we used to have to like de dust them. <laughs> and oh you, yeah! You, and you took the disc washer and you put the liquid on it over the red velvet. Yep. And you had to like wipe off. Yeah, I've, the, I've still got it. I've still got it. Yes, no. and and it, it still works. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'll tell you a great, a great story. I, Dennis McNamara who was the programming director of WLIR, and he's a friend, and he was a guest on the show. And he told me a great story. He was driving on the way to WLIR one morning, and he hears, shk, shk, shk. <laughs> and I knew it that way. Well, apparently, the DJ passed out, and the, the <laughs> last song on the record was going, <laughs> it was just skipping back and forth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> And he had because he said, "Oh my God, there's still, you know, there's dead air." So, but you can't get that, you know. That's that's truly part of the whole vinyl oh, that's experience. That's part of the magic, right? The hisses, and all the pops, pops. And yeah. at the beginning, absolutely at the beginning of every track, and now, when, uh, lifting and carefully lifting the needle and all that. I know. Now, did, did you? Stuff. Were you one of those people who had like you had the Technics turntable and the Marantz? Yep. Uh, you know, yep. equalizer yep. and the Harman Kardon yep. speed because you had to have yep. you, like you couldn't yep. buy one brand; you had to buy different components and put them together. Because you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I and I got rid of equipment now that I look back and think, "Ooh, I wish I hadn't done that." But there we are. That's 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 true of everybody. So, what was the first forty-five or seventy-eight or thirty-three that you remember buying yourself? The first seventy-eight. And I, by the way, I have pretty much all the first American or English releases on 78 that Elvis did. Wow. Um, uh, the first 78 I brought was Cool Water by Frankie Lane. And the first 45 I bought was Diana Paul Anker. Wow. Wow. There you are. See, you see how you see how you just knew that. We, we I knew all, it instantly. We all knew it instantly. So, yes. See, yes. everybody who loved music in that day. Yes. Uh, where, yes. Do, you, do you remember where you bought them? No. Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Where? Where did you yes. buy? Yeah, uh, I, I bought them because I bought them at school because there was a record shop where you could, if you were allowed to go into the town, which you were occasionally, you could uh, you could go into the record shop and stand in booths. And hear the record, they play it for you in the booth. Do you, do you, do you I, 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 I do about? remember that. Yes, we had that here too. We, we yeah. Okay. Yeah, you were able well, to... that's it. That's that's where I bought them. That's where they came from. All right. So then, let's fast forward for a second. You're driving in a car. You're listening to the radio, and you hear one of your songs as you're in the car. When was the first time you remember that? And what was that like as a feeling to you? <sighs> there is. I listen. I worked with a lot of wonderful musicians. Uh, particularly recently, and over there, you know, met a lot of people when I was working with chat. And they all say, I know a lot of people who are musical geniuses, and they've never had that feeling. They've never heard it. They've never been driving along and had, hey, you're going to a great new record <laughs> by uh, this is, you know, and all that well, radio talk, and then hear yourself on the radio. Well, I first heard myself on the radio in England. Uh, and with a song called Yesterday's Gone, which was a hit in England. Uh, it's our first record. And it's, it's a wonderful, it's an extraordinary feeling. Um, and it's not given to anybody. Uh, it's, it's really, I mean, so many people who deserve it have never heard this. They've never had that experience. So do you, do you now look at your videos from the 60s and things like that when you're on television 
Uh-huh. And, and can you go back and actually remember those moments as you live that moment? Uh, or do you kind of see it? Or do you kind of see it as some other guy? You know, even though it's you, it's just some other guy because you're just different now. Is, um, or is it both? Or is it a little bit of in the middle? It's it's yeah, it's an interesting one. That I uh, um, if you're talking about if if you're talking about the Dick Van Dyke show or something like that or the Batman, I see somebody giving a performance. If you're talking about cheesy videos that we <laughs> did uh, miming to something on the Dick Clark show, I think that's that's sort of, that's a different world. That is very strange. Because, um, you know, you're just standing there doing strange things that you know, it looks cheesy, and there are people sort of pretending to do dancing around you and all that. You know, those yeah. those, those teen shows that we all used to do, um, they're very odd. They're more, they're stranger than the Batmans and the Dick Van Dykes. W- was, that, was that the first reality TV, <laughs> in a way? Yeah, what a, what a good statement that is. In a funny kind of way, yeah. And, you know, I mean, I look back at who, I mean, we... There was some teen show that we um, uh, hosted, and there was Stevie Wonder. Uh, wow. He was on it. And, uh, you know, I've worked with extraordinary people. I mean, Dion Warwick was on something, I remember. I mean, extraordinary bills have been on uh, with, with people who are geniuses. We're on a bill with Chuck Berry once, um, and Roy Orbison, and, you know, uh, uh, extraordinary. Uh, these are, but that's the stuff I, I remember, the backstage stuff so, uh, and the hero worship stuff. So it's looking at those clips can sometimes be pretty cheesy. I mean, honestly. So when does the memoir come out? <laughs> why not? I mean, you have great stories. Well, I'll tell, you why, I'll tell you what the problem with the memoir is, is that the publishers always want to know about the sex, basically. They want to know about, uh, you know, my and my my sex and drugs years that's what they want and they want names and they want salacious details and all that i mean i had a little moment with uh quite a big moment with marianne faithful who but she wrote about that in her book so i'm allowed to say that uh-huh. um, <laughs> that's called waiver and she's, and she's still an old friend but i don't that's an area i really don't want to get into also because i didn't have my drugs hell you know, I've gone on and done other things, and life has gone on, and um, still here and still able to string a sentence together. So it's sort of, it's kind of, uh, it's that, that's the stuff I'm, I, I um, avoid, rather. Um, but maybe one of these days. I don't know. I, it's, the more I talk about it, the more it, I go, well, maybe, you know. Uh, as a fan, okay, just in a humble opinion as a fan, uh, I would love to to either hear a podcast of these great memories and collaborations and bands and, and meetings. Well, and, you or might read have talked me into it. You well, we'll see, Richard. We'll see. Yeah. See how we go. Eh? So, all right, so let's talk about the future because you know. Uh, yeah. the, 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 so, what do you, what do we have coming down the road? We got all these you know concerts and all these things. I'm and, just, okay. and your okay, seven or eight all, future bottom drawer things. Yeah. First of all, okay. Uh, first of all, Peter and I, Peter Asher, Jeremy Clyde are doing oh, the Peter uh, and Gordon catalog and the Chad and Jeremy catalog, and plus some other things, all kinds of covers and things, influences. Uh, we're putting in a, an Ed Sheeran song in the next set, I think, which uh, because Peter's produced Ed and knows him, and uh, you know, we're, we're sort of mixing and matching. That's that's the very that's the commercial that's the the nostalgia uh, set, but because I put out started putting out these these albums very quietly and they started to get this considerable following. I mean, really extraordinary. Um, I'm going to continue doing those. The bottom drawer sessions has become a sort of is to clear out my bottom drawer because if you think about it, if you've got songs. And, you know, you're suddenly no longer around. I mean, the songs don't exist. They can only exist if you record them. I mean, a poet can write down a few lines on a piece of paper and then croak. 
<laughs> and somebody can come across a piece of paper. But, you, you know, you yeah. actually have to go into a studio and make music uh, for it to live, to be there. Oh, hey. So that's what I'm doing. And it's really, um, and because it's got interest, and because it's getting interest from another generation, this is the real point. And that's really extraordinary to me, but this is what's coming along is that, yes, there are the people who come to because they were there and they remember and they grew up with, but then the, there's their children and their children's children, and then there are people in their teens or early 20s who ha are obsessed by the 60s because the 60s never went away. No. That's the extraordinary thing. It, unlike other generations, they just didn't leave, and their echoes are still with us in the most extraordinary way. Um, and that is why, that is what is so much fun to look back on and also to, um, you know, say, well, actually, you know, you like this song from 1979, uh, from 69, which I recorded, but how about this one, which I never got around to recording, which is from 1970? Well, if I... And they go, wow, that's really interesting. It's never been heard before. I don't know. It's never been heard before. It's been in the bottom drawer. Well, if you want a little suggestion, a humble suggestion, how about a radio yeah. series with all this stuff? You know, I'd love to. I think, I'd absolutely I think, love to. I think you should get on the air and do, you know... Uh, listen, here's you know. my problem, Rich. Listen, here's, here's my problem. I don't live here. I live, I live in England. I've got a sort of another whole life. Uh, I mean, I've just come off an aeroplane and we're going to do some, I'm going to do some dates and then I'm going to go home. But you're absolutely right. Somehow, Pete, now Peter Ash has been doing his serious Beatles um, stuff and I guess maybe one of these days if I can um, get it together but I know he has a, I mean, it's a hell of a job just going, you know, just putting it on the radio you've got to kind of keep it going and you've got to put a lot of time and work in uh, and he lives in uh, you know in the place where he records which is California well, if you need I a, don't know it's if, a thought if you need a cheering section call me <laughs> fine you're on right, okay. in, in the okay. last minute or two okay. tell, tell me about Downton Abbey Downton Abbey, oh, God, yeah. Well, it's become this uh, huge thing. I, I mean, when I did it, it was just a sort of, I popped in and uh, hid behind a moustache, and, um, and, and a lot of people didn't know I was doing it because I was doing a bit of acting and pretending I wasn't me, and that is, I, that's what, to me, acting is about. It's about transformation. Uh, I don't like being me particularly. I like to, you know, if, when I'm doing that, and actually, when I started to work with Chad again, I had to teach myself how to be me on stage because I was so used to being characters on stage. Now I'm quite happy. I've learned how to do it. But I had to start again because I was so used to being a character and walking on stage left and saying the lines and walking off again um, that just who am I? To be questioned. Uh, uh, the persona. Uh, and I now have got the, you know, I've learned, but I had to start from the beginning. Uh, Downton Abbey was great fun. Lovely. Wow. Uh, sweet people, you know, loved it. All right, so in the last 30 seconds, uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for, for spending an hour with me. I, sure. re I really do. Uh, social media, where could people find your, you know, your social media stuff, Facebook and all that great bottom stuff? Draw sessions, bottom draw sessions com. Uh, Jeremy Clyde has a, a web page uh, the Chad and Jeremy website is still up and running and there are links all over there, there uh, and on the Jeremy Clyde and Bottom Draw Sessions there are videos, there are, there are commentaries on the tracks where they, when they were written uh, what was going on at the time um, all that kind of thing so there's a, a, a whole world uh, and people have now got this Bottom Draw Sessions thing going and it's kind of a joke also it's kind of i'm not trying to make the great album i'm just clearing out the bottom drawer <laughs> <laughs> and, and with that thank you so kindly thank you for being uh, uh, on the show it's been a pleasure and what fun. love the stories and for those who listened thank you for being part of my radio family we'll see you next week and if you can catch jeremy at, at my father's place all right we'll see you in a week <laughs>